This is Brian Schwartz at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm going to be speaking to you today about an overview of clinical infectious diseases with a focus on prevention. I'm an infectious diseases doctor. I care for a wider range of patients with different types of infection, not only thinking about diagnosis and treatment, but I also think frequently about how I can prevent the next infection. So our learning objectives for today are one, for you to learn about ways to eliminate pathogens from the environment. Two, I'd like you to be able to describe three ways to prevent the spread of different pathogens. Three, know that immunizations are a highly effective method for prevention of many infections. Four, recognize which situations that chemoprophylaxis might be useful to prevent infections. And lastly, learn about the role of the public health uh, departments in disease prevention. So, Starting off, how do you prevent an infection in the first place? Well, there's four ways that I would think about preventing infections. One is you could eradicate any potential pathogens from the environment because if they're not there, uh, then they're not gonna be able to get into your patient. Two, you can create barriers to spread if there are pathogens around. Three, you could induce active or passive immunity in your patient to prevent potential infection from causing disease. And four, you could actually give chemoprophylaxis or antimicrobial agents um, to inhibit uh, the growth of organisms if they were to infect your patient. So let's start by talking about eradicating pathogens from the environment. There's four ways that we tend to think about it. Um, the most effective way to eliminate all pathogens is a technique called sterilization. Sterilization allows the killing of all microbes, and the key here is that they also that sterilization also kills spores. Spores are produced by uh, certain types of bacteria. Clostridium difficile is one that produces a spore. Um, these are very hard to eradicate and can germinate and cause disease later, even when you think you've gotten everything else. So a sterilization uh, using an autoclave at 101 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes is able to kill all microbes, including spores. This is used for all uh, surgical equipment um, and many other uh, different instruments that are used invasively in patients. Next is disinfection. So disinfection is reducing microbes to the level that it can not cause disease. Um, and this is a common practice used uh, in patients' rooms, for example, where you couldn't do true sterilization of a patient room. You use disinfection with uh, different chemicals to reduce the load of microbes, things like bleach solutions, etc. Antisepsis is when you reduce microbes on human tissue. Many of the chemicals that we use for disinfection would not be safe for using on human tissue. So we tend to use other uh, types of chemicals that are safe, and this is termed antisepsis. Lastly, probably a term that you've all heard about uh, is pasteurization. Uh, a lot of the uh, foods that you drink, like milk, for example, are pasteurized. Um, this is when you heat liquid to a point of killing pathogens, but you're not able uh, to kill the spores. Um, and this is something that's uh, been used very frequently uh, for many decades uh, to reduce um, illness associated with uh, food consumption. So next, let's talk a little bit about c creating barriers to the spread of infection, um, otherwise known as different types of precautions. So as an infectious diseases doctor, when I take care of patients with different types of infections, um, I need to protect myself uh, when I'm taking care of these patients as well. And so I use a number of different types of precautions. Um, I'll start off by talking about droplet precautions. Droplet precautions are when patients have an infection, for example, a respiratory virus like influenza. Um, patients can spread that uh, respiratory virus by droplets, by coughing, and it's felt that you can spread for about three feet away. Um, so if you wear a mask to both cover your mouth and nose, as well as eye protection, it's very unlikely that you're gonna get infected. Obviously, you also wanna use good hand hygiene techniques because if you were to touch it on your hands and then touch mouth, eyes, etc., you could also get infected that way. But that's part of universal precautions, which we'll talk about. Airborne precautions is another uh, way that we protect ourselves when patients are infected um, with different types of organisms that can be spread through the air. Airborne precautions is a little bit different in that um, these organisms like TB or tuberculosis or VZZ, VZV, otherwise known as varicella zoster virus, um, can be spread um, much farther than three feet. 
And the types of mass that we use there are able to pick up uh, smaller particles and prevent transmission. Uh, we tend to term these N95 masks. And when you take, take care of patients at the wards, you'll be asked to be fit for these. Contact precautions are when you are um, using precautions to make sure that you don't um, get on your skin uh, or clothing um, a certain pathogen. For example, Clostridium difficile, which causes C. diff colitis, um, can produce bacteria and spores that can get on you. So when you go into patients with a uh, room who have this, you tend to do contact precautions, which is wearing gloves um, and a gown uh, to prevent contact. And then universal precautions is what you use on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, you don't, um, it's very clear that you always wash your hands when you go in to see patients, wash your hands when you leave. You don't touch um, with your bare skin any open uh, wounds or any purulent uh, uh, draining uh, areas you um, are, are all considered universal precautions. And, and when you get on the floor uh, and start taking care of patients, both in clinics and the inpatient setting, you'll learn more about this and you'll have additional training. Okay, another mechanism to prevent infection is inducing active or passive immunity. And so we'll talk about these uh, in two different ways. So active immunity, you're probably all familiar with because the classic way that we induce immunity in patients um, is immunization. Active immunity often uh, is delayed, so you expose somebody to an antigen um, of the organism that you're trying to protect against, and then it requires some time for the immune system to uh, produce an, an, uh, an immune response. However, usually when you make this kind of response, it's long lasting. For some types of organisms that you're protecting against, you'll have to give booster vaccinations, um, and but often these are very long lasting and they mimic what we see in patients who have um, post-infection um, when they develop immunity. Some, but certainly not all of the immunizations available for bacteria, we vaccinate against Streptococcus pneumoniae, which can cause pneumonia, meningitis, um, Haemophilus influenzae, particularly type B, um, was one of the leading causes of meningitis in young children and has now essentially been eliminated with the development of an outstanding vaccine. We vaccinate against viruses. Probably almost all of you have had your flu shot in the last year, uh, been vaccinated against measles, mumps, rubella, etc. Passive immunity is a little bit different, and you probably are less familiar with this. Passive immunity is when you transfer preformed antibodies. Um, against whatever organism you're worried about. And the benefit is usually immediate, however, it's temporary because once your body eliminates those uh, antibodies that you acquire, you're, you lose your protection. Um, one of the more common examples for bacterial or particularly bacterial toxins is Clostridium tetani and the tetanus toxin. There's a preformed toxin antibody against that toxin that you can get if you're um, exposed to that disease, and then a number for viruses, rabies, varicella zoster virus, respiratory syncytial virus that are used for different patients in different settings. Now chemoprophylaxis is another one. So chemoprophylaxis is when usually the risk of infection outweighs the risk of medication-related toxicity, and probably one of the most common places you've heard of this are in patients with HIV or AIDS, also patients who have undergone transplantation, either solid organ transplantation or stem cell transplantation, are often given medication to prevent lots of different types of infection. One of them that you think about is giving trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, also known as Bactrim or Septra, to prevent pneumocystis uh, gerevechiae pneumonia, also known as PCP. Travelers who are going to malaria endemic areas um, who you don't want to get malaria, they'll often get different uh, medications. And one of them is atovaquone proguanol, also known as malarone, which can be taken daily to prevent malaria infection. Our last and probably very important line of uh, defense is our public health departments. So there are public health departments at the international level, like the World Health Organization, um, that help, helps mount um, global responses to things like the Ebola uh, epidemic that's going on in West Africa. Um, on the national level, our Centers 
for disease control and prevention, helps with outbreaks and uh, prevention of infections uh, nationally. Uh, and then locally are both city and state. So for here, I live in California. So there's the California Department of Public Health, but also the city of San Francisco has a Department of Public Health uh, that helps on many different fronts. Um, all these uh, organizations are really helpful. And as you move on to care of these patients, um, you'll probably be in contact with both your city and your state Department of Public Health as you're um, confronted with different patients with different types of infections. This is going to end my session on uh, prevention in discussion of clinical infectious diseases.